in on the China issue that is exploding before our very eyes with uh, Joe Biden and company a little bit behind the curve. Steve, good afternoon. How are you? Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Christopher Mannion. It's good to be here with you again and to, with everyone who's listening and watching. Well, Steve, um, I don't know where to start because uh, neither did our team that went to Alaska to talk to the Alaska team of uh, uh, Chinese representatives from the foreign ministry. <clears throat> Things didn't come off too well there, I'm afraid. Um, and in the wake of that meeting, uh, perhaps you want to give us a little uh, set the table for where we are now after that disaster. Well, that was what I call the Alaska ambush. I think it was uh, uh, a, a scandal that we were we were embarrassed and humiliated on our own territory, uh, Alaska, the state of Alaska, uh, by the representatives of the Chinese Communist Party. And and part of it, I think, Chris, is just that that the Biden team simply didn't do its homework uh, mm -hmm. before they got on the plane and and went to Anchorage, Alaska, to meet with uh, Yang Jiechi and and the other uh, leaders of the foreign policy establishment of the Chinese Communist Party. Because normally these meetings are scripted out. Uh, normally the uh, statements are drafted uh, often in advance. And then uh, of course you, 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 you know what's coming, you know what issues will be raised and you know at least uh, in broad outline what the outcome is going to be. Uh, these people walked into an ambush uh, after Anthony Blinken made a two-minute statement, the uh, Chinese side was supposed to respond with a two-minute statement. But uh, Yang Jiechi, who is the senior ranking uh, Chinese foreign policy um, person in the Chinese Communist Party, went on for uh, almost 17 minutes. And he basically raked the United States and the Biden administration over the coals. And I, I don't know why, quite frankly, I was watching this exchange and, and thinking to myself that uh, President Reagan, uh, President Trump, uh, the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and probably uh, President uh, George Bush would not have tolerated uh, this kind of uh, grandstanding, uh, this kind of leaving the script. I think they would have turned off the mics or shooed the press from the room or gotten up and left the room. Yes. Uh, as you recall, Reykjavik, uh, at Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, when Mikhail Gorbachev, then Soviet leader, came and demanded uh, that we abandon uh, the Star Wars program of missile defense, uh, Reagan stood up, walked out of the room, got on the plane and left. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Uh, World War III did not break out. Within a few months, the Gorbachev was back at the negotiating table, dropping his ridiculous demands, and things moved forward from there, um, eventually leading to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, you know, a weakness in, invites aggression, as we all know, and, and strength deters it. And what was on display in Anchorage was, was weakness. And then when when, when Yang Jiechi finally stopped haranguing us, uh, telling us, telling the United States that uh, we were in no position to lecture China about human rights violations because our human rights uh, situation was, uh, was equally bad or worse, which is laughable and ludicrous, of course, because right now, as far as I know, we're not committing genocide against uh, any, any of the many, many peoples who live in the United States. China is committing genocide uh, in the far west of the country against the, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, 12 million strong, mostly Muslim, not entirely so. There are also Kazakhs and uh, Uzbeks and other Turkish minorities living in the re region. They're being uh, the subject of genocidal policies as well. And it's not just the, uh, the Uyghurs, it's uh, Tibetans are now being uh, herded into uh, re-education camps as well, uh, forced to live in, in uh, apartment buildings constructed by the Chinese Communist Party, forced to leave their nomadic way of life. Uh, their children are forced to go to school and learn Chinese and, and not allowed to speak Tibetan. 
So the, the whole uh, genocidal campaign is spreading throughout all the minority regions of China. And, and instead, of, instead of going on the attack and, and responding uh, with truthful statements about the abysmal human rights situation in China, our Secretary of State began apologizing mm-hmm. uh, for the United States, apologizing at length, uh, talking about how you know we had often take, taken steps backward, that we had many problems. That, I mean, it was it was it was an apology um, in 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 front of the eyes of the world, the eyes of uh, the billion Chinese and and the hundreds of millions of Americans. And I thought we were done with apology tours. I was certainly done with apology tours by the time that Obama and Biden left office a few mm-hmm. years ago. Uh, I recall many people watching will recall that uh, that Obama spent the first year of his presidency going around the world and apologizing uh, for the existence, the very existence of the country that had just elected him president of the United States. It was an embarrassing spectacle. And now we're treated to the same kind of embarrassing spectacle on the part of our top diplomat. And again, weakness invites aggression. And I'm afraid the Chinese are uh, going to be walking all over us for the next four years. Well, I noticed among uh, Yang's comments, uh, the dismissal uh, back of the hand that he gave to Western civilization altogether. Uh, No longer does this uh, tradition uh, as old as Christendom, but not as old as China. uh, No longer does this uh, tradition of uh, the dignity of the individual, uh, limited government, and uh, civil virtue, civic virtue, and moral virtue. Uh, He says, well, that's just the uh, view of some people, and China will no longer be uh, even uh, willing to try to meet those standards, which early on the left has always tried to mimic and and insist that it does better than we do. Not anymore. They're completely dismissing our traditions and telling us that the rest of the world is abandoning us, and so too are people within our own country. The Americans yeah. themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was uh, amazing how the leftist lies uh, about America being a a a, a uh, racist and misogynistic and and uh, uh, all all of the the lies that the left tells about the United States are now being weaponized by our primary uh, enemy, our primary opponent, our primary competitor overseas, the People's Republic of China, and of course. Uh, the PRC, the Chinese Communist Party, through United Front Tactics, has, has done everything it can to stoke violence in the United States. Uh, we won't hear that from the national security apparatus of mm-hmm. this administration. But the Chinese Communist Party has been very active on social media. It's been very active in funding and organizing demonstrations in major cities of the United States. That's why we shut down the Houston consulate a few months ago. Mm -hmm. They were engaging in precisely this kind of activity. So uh, this whole propaganda narrative is in part generated with support of the Chinese Communist Party and then seized upon by the Chinese Communist Party to attack the United States. It is classic uh, Communist Party United Front tactics. They used it very effectively during the Chinese Civil War against the nationalists by setting up a fifth column in the nationalist controlled areas along the coast of China mm-hmm. and using, then using the propaganda that they had generated to attack the nationalist regime during the civil war, finally wound up defeating the nationalists, driving them to Taiwan and taking control of China. Now they're using the same tactics against the rest of the world and principally against uh, the United States. Uh, but, I, but I have to say that, um, that uh, President Joe Biden almost teed up that attack for them uh, because recall it wasn't that long ago that he said with regard to the Uyghur genocide that this was sort of, uh, you know, part of uh, Chinese culture and uh, thereby excusing human rights abuses as something something uh, unique to Chinese culture that uh, we could not be um, you know, cultural imperialists and criticized because after all, that's the way that China has always been. And China was happy to use that argument uh, against us uh, in, in defending themselves and attacking 
uh, the United States. And uh, that, uh, that, whole, that whole approach, I'm afraid we're going to see uh, again and again over the next few years, but it's not just going to be uh, verbal harassment. Uh, we're going to see, I think, aggressive acts on the part of China towards uh, India, towards uh, its neighbors on the South China Sea, towards Vietnam, uh, towards mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, Australia has taken the brunt of China's economic warfare over the last few months. That warfare is continuing. Australian exports to, to China are down by uh, almost two thirds uh, because China is trying to punish Australia for questioning the origin of the China virus uh, by cutting off uh, exports from Australia to uh, China. And of course, we see aggression towards Taiwan. Just yesterday, uh, a, a flotilla, uh, an air wing plus of 20 planes invaded Taiwan's airspace, the largest uh, incursion to date. 20 planes, including bombers and fighters, is a fairly significant incursion. And now we have Chinese warships also uh, circling uh, Japanese islands in the, uh, in the uh, East China Sea around the Senkaku Islands. So uh, China is really, really testing the boundaries at all points of the compass. And they're testing the boundaries. Why? Why? Because they sense weakness. Well, when I uh, just, uh, I expected Yang to turn over his lapel and have a Bernie Sanders button underneath the way he was borrowing all the language of Sanders and company and the yeah. socialist dimension of the Democrat party, which is quite large. Well, what's been with Formosa, with Taiwan, I see that Admiral John Aquilino testified earlier on Capitol Hill this week uh, that retaking Taiwan is the number one priority of the Chinese communists. Uh, of course, that should be self-evident and they're very focused on this the peripheral, battle, the peripheral battles we've been describing are really distractions to keep us handling all the problems of the peripheries while they do the focus that you're describing. Uh, what comes next? Well, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, has already uh, missed his deadline for invading Taiwan because he said mm -hmm. he was going to retake Taiwan by 2020. That has not happened. But China is building up its Navy and its Air Force uh, and its Marines, uh, which is a new force, just uh, started uh, as part of the People's Liberation Army a couple of years ago at a tremendous rate. And obviously the, the, the principal use of that Air Force, Marine Force, uh, will be to try and retake the island of Taiwan, of course, which sits strategically uh, along the Chinese coast, preventing China, the Chinese Navy, from easy access uh, to the vast reaches of the Pacific Ocean. Um, we have in place, at least um, now being put in place, and it, this began uh, many, many years ago, uh, the Quad, uh, that is uh, military cooperation between Japan and uh, the United States, Australia, and India uh, for uh, great democracies. Uh, we should be moving in the direction very quickly of the Quad plus one, uh, which would be the Quad and, and Taiwan itself. Taiwan mm -hmm. needs to be included in that defensive perimeter. It's a key linchpin of that defensive perimeter. There's only uh, 50 miles or so separate the northern uh, most limits of Taiwan from the southernmost uh, Japanese held island. And only about the same distance from the southern tip of uh, Taiwan at Olanbi down to the beginning of the Philippines. So uh, Taiwan is obviously key to the defense of the first island chain. And for that matter, bring in the Philippines, bring in South Korea and other nations uh, uh, that are democracies into this defensive perimeter. And at, we do that uh, not for the purposes of aggression. No one is talking about invading uh, the, the Asian mainland, uh, but we do it for defensive purposes to deter uh, China from aggressive actions. Uh, people don't understand that um, the Chinese claims that uh, the economy is robust and it has roared back and it is doing better than any other G20 economy post China virus. Uh, is, is in part a fabrication. 
Uh, they have a, a shortage of hard currency right now, so they have economic problems coming down the pike. And uh, we could very easily see uh, aggression overseas to distract the population at home from the economic turmoil that's coming. Well, with that in mind, uh, they're doing a lot to distract us from uh, their primary, uh, uh, their number one priority, as Admiral Aquilino put it, We've got the virus uh, still chasing uh, and being chased around the world. Uh, there have been new revelations this week. I read that the former head of the CDC uh, admits now uh, that the, uh, he's sure that the COVID China virus, as it's known, popular uh, language, came from Wuhan. Uh, is Wuhan still in business? Uh, in that uh, kind of enterprise, or are they moving on to uh, new uh, enterprises? Well, let's start with uh, what the former uh, director of the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, said. Uh, Robert Redfield uh, told uh, CNN uh, that it was his opinion that the New coronavirus responsible for now killing 2.7 million people globally did not evolve naturally. Uh, he said, uh, and, and here's a quote, I'm of the point of view that I still think the most likely etiology of the pathology in Wuhan was from a laboratory escaped. Now, I find it very curious uh, that he has waited until now to say this because I'm sure that he, uh, being a virologist, understood as early or even earlier than those of us uh, like uh, Bill Gertz and uh, Dr. Yan Li Meng, the, uh, the Chinese uh, refugee who came here with information about the laboratory origin of the virus. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious that this thing was uh, genetically engineered in the lab. And yet the entire virology establishment in the United States was mum, was silent about this until now. Um, so, so, um, so what's going on? Well, I think in part that was politics. Uh, people in the virology department, uh, uh, in the virology enterprise in the United States, uh, like Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, didn't want to help uh, the, the uh, Trump administration uh, by pointing to the obvious origin of the virus. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that uh, the, the uh, Biden administration is in power, they can begin, I think, to speak uh, more openly about, uh, about how this virus was uh, not only manufactured in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but was, uh, was released from there. Um, Redfield, uh, Redfield's uh, confession comes about uh, a year too late, in my opinion. Well, it comes to mind that late July of 2020 uh, was the marker I put down when Nancy Pelosi, to put a stop to this talk about Wuhan and everything else, coined the term Trump virus and kept pounding the table with the notion that whatever its yeah. origin, that Trump was responsible for the virus. And of course, there's no coherence here, no logic, but it was a very effective drumbeat that distracted the uh, public from the fact that was becoming increasingly evident every day about Wuhan's role in all this. Yeah, that's a, that's a, very, uh, that's a very important point that once they decided to politicize uh, the, the virus, and, and blame it on Trump. And of course, that didn't take a great intellectual leap because they blame, they blame everything on Trump, right? Um, <laughs> if, it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's a little warmer, it's Trump's fault. If it's a little cooler, it's Trump's fault. Um, so, and we saw that on full display at the, uh, at the uh, Joe Biden press conference uh, just the other day. Um, life, life only began, of course, in the view of the... Um, Democrat socialist uh, on the day that um, that uh, that Biden took office. So so the, the 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 point though is that China's deception over the coronavirus origins uh, 
it got more outrageous uh, as the weeks went by. Um, you know, first we heard it was a bat, then we heard it was a little scaly anteater called a pangolin, and then we heard it came from a cave in 2013. Then we heard a lab worker was bitten by a bat. Then we heard that it came from the US Army brought over during the military games in October of, of 2019. The stories, the, the, the stories were almost endless. And that itself, of course, is a clue that uh, the Chinese were not being, were not being uh, honest and candid about what, uh, what was going on. Um, you know, this is, this is called in, uh, in, in the law, it's called consciousness of guilt, right? Um, that's, that, that's what yeah. happens when the police knock on your front door and, and you run out the back door. Why? Because you know you're guilty and you're trying to escape uh, detection. Um, so China's been doing that from the get-go. But the degree of censorship surrounding the China virus, the laboratory origins of the China virus has been just astonishing. I mean, uh, I published an article back in February of uh, last year, over a year ago, uh, talking about the, the laboratory origins of the virus. And I, I was fact-checked, actually I call it fake-checked, uh, by people in the US virology establishment who had personal ties with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, who were professional colleagues of the uh, bat woman, Dr. Shi, Shi Zhang Li, who works there, and were interested in covering up the fact that they had worked in a lab that had created and released upon the world a dangerous virus that was killing millions of people. So, um, you know, there's really no question now, I think in my mind, that, uh, that it is a laboratory product and it was part of a bioweapons program. Uh, think about the fact that we now have the, the former chief investigator of the State Department's task force, which was set up by former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to investigate the origins of uh, COVID-19, to investigate the origins of the China virus. The chief investigator, whose name is David Asher, has now said publicly that that he not only believes the virus escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but also that it was the result of bioweapons research. Okay, mm -hmm. think about that, bioweapons research. And I have a direct quote here. He said, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is not the National Institute of Health. It was operating a secret classified program. In my view, the State Department officials said, it was a biological weapons program. And, and if, this is an explosive charge. I mean, think about the millions of deaths that have resulted yeah. from the coronavirus. Think about the trillions of dollars in damage that has been done. And this is a result of a bioweapon, but of course a growing body of evidence suggests that that's exactly what it, what it was. Uh, we know, I mean, we've known for some time that China does have a bioweapons program. They signed the International Convention uh, on Bioweapons back in 1984. The convention itself dates from 1972. China signed it in 1984, pledging not to develop uh, offensive bioweapons. Mm -hmm. But of course, like every other treaty, like every other treaty they've ever signed, the, the ink was no, no sooner dry on the paper than they began to violate it. Um, the list of broken treaties by China is, uh, is quite long and uh, includes this bioweapons convention. And we know that they were developing uh, bioweapons in the lab in Wuhan. We've known since 2017 that the People's Liberation Army had a program, was funding research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology to develop uh, and genetically engineer dangerous uh, coronaviruses. And one of those coronaviruses uh, is uh, the one that we're now dealing with. And there may be others. I mean, I'm not, I'm not at all convinced that, uh, that COVID-19 is the end of the story. They may have COVID-20 and COVID-2021 and, and, and on and on. Because these things, once you master the techniques, uh, Chris, these things are not difficult to manufacture. You a reasonably equipped laboratory in six months can produce something like COVID-19. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the frightening part of this whole story. Well, a couple of weeks ago when we spoke last, you discussed the uh, 
the way that China acts as kind of an action central for these programs yeah. that a lot of folks are excited about to find out who their ancestors were and what percentage of the Irish blood is really Irish. Um, I've got some friends who are really at each other's throats because one insists that he's more Irish than the other. Uh, with that in mind, China has all these millions and millions of data uh, which are identifiably Caucasian or African or whatever. Uh, and as you point out, uh, they have one concentrated goal. Uh, their priority strategically is Taiwan, but their priority in the long run is more power. How are they going to use those to possibly um, have an effective defense against the possibility that the United States, Europe, uh, India uh, could actually be effective in countering their China's next offensive effort? Well, in terms of bioweapons, of course, the, uh, uh, what, what China believes to be the, the high ground of, of bioweapons development is the development of ethnically targeted uh, viruses. Ethnically targeted viruses, that is viruses that target non-Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. And it could be Caucasians, could be Africans, could be South Koreans, uh, could be Japanese, any, any mm -hmm. genetically distinct people who are genetically distinct from the Chinese, the Han Chinese, uh, you know, might be susceptible to a weapon that, that uh, the, the Han Chinese themselves have a natural immunity to but is very infectious and, and lethal to other, to other peoples. Uh, the Han Chinese genome is, is quite distinct. They've been in the North China Plain for thousands of years, uh, largely without uh, much intermarriage with, uh, with uh, neighboring peoples. So um, they constitute a fairly, fairly distinct uh, genome, human genome. So, I mean, that's, that's, the, the, that's certainly a scary, a scary prospect. And, but that prospect, of course, is one reason why we have uh, recently, not soon enough, but, uh, but recently began to hear people sound the alarm about uh, the willy-nilly sending of uh, uh, you know, genetic information yeah. to China uh, to be analyzed. Um, I, I have to admit you know, that, uh, that, uh, that a couple of people in my family actually uh, did the genetic analysis just because of curiosity about their ancestors. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that that information is now in a huge database mm -hmm. in China and may be, may be used for nefarious purposes in, in, in the years to come. Well, to wind up, uh, when uh, our Secretary of State Blinken blinked, nonetheless, he had said some harsh words about China, but it harkens back to Obama's, the same drill with the Obama team that uh, they kind of winked, not blinked. They winked at one another and said, we'll use this language and you use that language and you just keep on keeping on. Is there anything that we can anticipate that the Biden administration will do right when it comes to dealing with China because of the threats that we all know are very, um, uh, imminent. Well, I mean, we, we, we know that to the extent that they continue the tough minded, uh, robust, uh, actions that were taken by the Trump administration that the United States will be, will be well served. And, and I was, I was pleased to see that the United States in conjunction with Canada, and the UK and the European Union has now placed new sanctions on a couple of senior Chinese Communist Party officials who are responsible for the ongoing genocide in, uh, in Eastern Turkestan in the far west of China against the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs. Now, the, these were the individuals who head, for example, the uh, Ministry of uh, Public Security in that area that is the, the gentleman who runs the police force. Uh, but make no mistake, we know 
that policy in China is dictated from the top down. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, who styles himself the core leader, the first core leader in the Chinese Communist Party since Chairman Mao Zedong, who also refers to himself as the great helmsman, uh, who also now has taken power away from the government and placed it in the hands of the military and the party, both of which he controls directly. Um, he centralized power in a way that no leader in China has since the days of Chairman Mao. He is cut from the same cloth and he is directly responsible for every act of aggression against Taiwan or against India or in the South China Sea. Uh, he's responsible for the wolf warrior approach of Chinese diplomats who are trying to impress the big boss by being tough on the United States and other countries, because that's what the big boss wants them to do. And of course, Xi Jinping, we understand, directly ordered the policy, the genocidal policy against the Uyghurs and now the Tibetans and Kazakhs to be put in place. Uh, the buck stops with him. And unless and until we get serious about sanctioning the senior leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, I'm afraid uh, uh, the human rights situation in China is not going to improve and China will continue to behave aggressively. Well, uh, as a parting shot, I wonder how many Chinese communists really believe that the buck stops over here with Joe Biden. But we'll leave that question open. Um, and 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 no one no one who watched the press, first press conference oh of President Joseph Biden uh, came away with with any other opinion than that this was the most carefully scripted, carefully choreographed, carefully orchestrated press conference probably in American political history, because he had in front of him pictures of each of the reporters, a couple dozen who were allowed in the room. And by those pictures, there were numerals from one to 10. He was instructed to call on specific reporters in a specific order to follow a specific script that he was reading. Can you imagine how the, the press would have melted down if uh, President Trump had had anything resembling uh, that kind of a, a cheat sheet. So clearly the man is not capable of carrying on an extended conversation about complex domestic and international mm -hmm. issues without having a written text in front of him. The whole world saw that. China certainly sees that. Yeah. And I'm afraid that kind of behavior um, is an open invitation to China to move forward on all fronts. Well, with regard to the reception of those uh, uh, utterances by the media, I could think only of the old Stalinesque rule that uh, when Stalin was speaking, the last, the first person to stop applauding was going to go to the gulag. So, with that, yeah. on that note, I hope that we can leave our listeners with a sense of humor, uh, which elsewhere in recent years has been so uh, desperately needed and absent. Oh, I'm Christopher Mannion at the Population Research Institute. In Front Royal Virginia, we've been speaking with Stephen Moser, our president and China scholar, who will be back with us in two weeks. Uh, in the meantime, we wish everyone a very happy and holy Easter season and uh, pray for good news of a human sort while we celebrate the good news of the eternal sort. Steve, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Chris.